Good morning. It is, uh, thank you, Ben. It is good to see you, church. Thank you for being here today. Uh, here we are, Shabbat. This uh, series, if you're, maybe you're just joining us for the first time today, the series is about Sabbath. We're really making a hard push that the Sabbath day, just a, we're saying Sabbath is a 24-hour period set aside during the week where you really focus on four things, where you focus on stopping the busy, and instead, we just, we learn to rest, delight, and worship. And what we found over the past couple of weeks that we've kind of unpacked it is Sabbath really wasn't a, um, it wasn't a, hey, if it's convenient for you, but the Lord said we really need to practice it. And it matters today because it mattered to Jesus. So today, um, I want to go one step further. Last week, we talked about stop. We talked about burnout. Um, today, what I want to do is I want to talk about what it means to rest. I would set it up this way. Um, it was, uh, I read a story this week. 19, uh, 1990, there was a gentleman from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he went to a flea market. He was just looking, just trying to see if there was anything that he thought might be worth purchasing, and he comes across an antique frame. He loved the frame. The painting, he didn't really care that much about, but he loved the frame. So he went up to the front and asked how much for it, and the guy's like, I'll sell it to you for $4. So he buys this antique frame for $4. He goes home. He flips it over. He's going to take the painting out because there was something else he wanted to put in there. And as he does, between the canvas painting and the, the wooden back to the frame, there was a trifolded piece of paper, yellowed paper, that slid out. And he takes the piece of paper, he opens it up, he recognizes a few words here. It looks to be fairly official, very old, somewhat important, but he thinks, you know what, I'll just look at that later. I'll go see if this has any value later. And I think, if I remember the story correctly, literally like a year, two years passes, and he's talking about this to a friend, and the friend was like, well, did you ever get that appraised? Did you ever find out what that was? And he said, I didn't. So he went back, he takes that piece of paper, he takes it to someone official, and what he discovers is that what he had in his possession was a copy of the Declaration of Independence. There were 24 known copies to be in existence. By the way, this guy is not Nicolas Cage. That's a movie. This is real. And it was like one of the most pristine copies that they have ever found. So it goes to auction. He only got around, I think it was $8 million, what this trifolded, discarded piece of paper was actually appraised for and sold for. I will always be a sucker for like antique roadshow, right? Any of these stories where someone has something that they feel is, it's okay, but what they don't realize is that what they have in their possession is something of incredible value. And I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that that's not a bad descriptor for Sabbath. There's a, a rabbi, um, his name is Abraham Heschel. And there's a quote that he has where he talks about the value of Sabbath. And he says that this way, Sabbath is really one of the most precious presents that the human race has received from the treasure house of God. Unless one learns how to relish the taste of Sabbath, one will be unable to enjoy the taste of eternity in the world to come. Think about it. Six days a week, we wrestle with the world, ringing profit from the earth, but on the Sabbath, we especially care for the seed of eternity that is planted in the soul. This last sentence is one of my favorites. The world has our hands, but our soul belongs to someone else. Isn't that good? The world has our hands, but our souls? Don't we need to be reminded that that belongs to someone else? I love that one. But there's another theologian, you may be familiar with him, he's called Winnie the Pooh. Well, he said this, don't underestimate the value of doing nothing, of just going along, listening to all the things you can't hear and not bothering. My friends, today, let's talk about rest. 
that invitation that Jesus makes to us, the one who calmed the winds and the waves and the seas is the one who calls us into a place of rest in our lives. I believe that we can find rest for our souls. So my prayer has been at the conclusion of this service, you would feel as if you had just taken the greatest nap of your lives. And my friends, if that happens after my preaching, that is a work of the Holy Spirit. So will you join me in a word of, uh, in a word of prayer? And let's just center our hearts one more time and let's just look at rest through Luke 10 and John 15. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this word today. Oh, there's such a sweet presence of the Holy Spirit uh, today. It's just unhurried. And Lord, in a world that just seems to be so fast-paced, and my week this week has just been so busy, but yet in these moments of stillness, your rest has just been so great for me this week. And Father, I just pray over hearts in this space today, those that are ready to receive, those that maybe there's a little bit of distraction thinking about the things to come. Uh, Father, the um, unrestlessness maybe that exists in the souls of people. Uh, Father, show us your rest. But more than just show us your rest through the, the scripture and through the words today, I just pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that, Father, we would just experience your rest today. So calm, anxious hearts, worried minds, busy lives, and maybe, just maybe, over this Labor Day weekend, we can just carve out some time to turn off the noise, to be present with those that we love, and, Father, to look in your eyes and find the rest that you make available to us. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done, for what you're doing, for what you have in store. Be glorified. And it's in the name of Jesus that we say, amen. All right, if you have a Bible, uh, two places I'm gonna go today. So first place, let me encourage you to open up to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Maybe you've heard the story before. Jesus, uh, in this particular moment, is going to see some friends. There are times that Jesus would go into a Pharisee's house. He would go and talk with people that maybe he was meeting with for the very first time. But I was, I was mentioning this to Pierce. I feel like this particular story is a little bit like a home group. Jesus is going to see Mary and Martha. It's not the first time he's encountered them. These are our family friends. They have a brother named Lazarus. In fact, I think it's in um, The Chosen last season. If you haven't, I, you know, I just I can't say enough about The Chosen. I love it. And Jesus was talking with Lazarus, I think, in the last season. And they were saying goodbye to each other. And Lazarus is like, will I see you again? And Jesus smirked and said, count on it. He dies and he raises him, if you don't know. So it was kind of a funny nudge there. But um, that's what's happening. So Jesus is literally going to visit some friends. So Luke 10 records it this way, starting in verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him, and she had a sister called Mary. Now, where was Mary? Pay attention. She sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. Say distracted. Anybody here just want to go ahead and confess that there are times in your lives where you are distracted? Anybody? Like in the first service, someone didn't raise their hands. They just pointed to the person next to them. Like that helps me out too. Thank you for that. Yeah, so we know that in this moment, Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, but Martha is distracted. And Why? Well, she's distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. So she came to him, Jesus, and she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Sounds like sisters, right? And by the way, it's not written here, but I feel like Mary just looks at Martha and goes, are you kidding? I'm right here. Why don't you just talk to me? Do you have to talk to Jesus? Right here, heard everything you just said. Talk to me. <laughs> I mean, clearly, you can feel there's a little bit of tension in the room. And here's how I know, because Jesus would say Martha's name not once, but twice. I feel like it went like this. Martha, Martha, <laughs> you are worried and you are upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. 
And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. You know, growing up in the church, any time I would hear this story for a long time, I really struggled with this story. Like, what do you do with this? Like, I, I almost feel like the story between Mary and Martha is really just what, what, what Luke's saying is you have to choose. You're either gonna be a Martha or you're gonna be a Mary. But look, I'm, I'm always an advocate here for making a case for work, right? Like the very first week of this, we talked about six days. There is sacred, there is something sacred in using our hands. God has called us to work. Was there anything wrong with what Martha was doing? I, I really don't think there was. If you found out today Jesus was coming to your house at a last minute notice, I'm gonna guess you would wanna make sure the dishes are done pretty quickly before Jesus walked in the room, right? Like, I'm gonna guess, you, you don't wanna give him the old stuff. You wanna give him, like, something that's fresh, something that's new. So Martha's busy doing all this, but Mary's just sitting at the feet. So is it choose either Martha or Mary? I don't. I think what's happening here is it's really about balance. There is a balance that needs to be found. And see, the thing about Martha, at the heart of her, there was just a distraction. Like, Jesus says, you are worried about many things, but few things are needed, in fact, only one. And I wonder how many of us in this room today, if we're gonna be honest, we are worried and anxious and distracted by many things, but really, if we're gonna be honest, only a few things are worthy of being worried over, but the thing we need to remember is there is one thing that is more important than anything else, and it's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Distraction, it gets us all the time. You know, I, uh, I have a, a grandbaby, he is four months old now, I still can't believe it, and for all of you who have said to me, being a grandparent's the greatest thing in the world, you are absolutely right, there is just nothing better. And as much as I love being a grandparent, you know what I've also found? What I've loved equally as much? Watching my kid raise his child, right? Like all the things that you said I did wrong, I just can't wait to see how you're gonna do this right, good luck, buddy. Just be watching your entire life. And my son was telling me, he was like, look, I gotta tell you, Dad Simon, he was telling me a couple weeks ago that Simon, something happens around dinner time, and I, I think he knows that the sun's gonna set and he's gonna have to do that mandatory go to sleep thing at night. And he says during supper, Nick was like, Dad, he just starts screaming and crying and we can't console him and we can't eat and he doesn't wanna eat and he's just mad. So last week I was checking in with my boy and I was like, so how is Simon doing? Is he, is he doing better around supper time? Is, is, is a little bit of peace kind of coming in during that time in your life? And he's like, dad, you'd be so proud. I was like, tell me more. He said, I got it all figured out. He said, hold on, let me send you a picture. This is what he sent me. Yeah. Again, questioning my parent raising abilities, I <laughs> say to my son, uh, is that paint on my grandbaby? And he said, dad, it's, well, first off, hold on, it's painter's tape. It's not, you know, no babies were harmed in the making of this picture, so everybody stay calm. But he said, what I started doing is he said on Simon's high chair, I just started putting these little blue pieces of painter's tape all over. And he said, bonus, I just started sticking it to his face. Because what I found is um, he just all of a sudden started just, you know, kind of like looking. He's just learning hand and eye coordination, right? And what Nick has said is it has distracted him <laughs> from the fussy and all of the things that are bothering him. As I was talking about rest this week, as I was studying the word this week, I just kind of thought, you know what, that's not a bad picture for our culture and our society today. Because if we're a people about rest, we have to understand that we are also a people who can be restless. We suffer from restlessness. There's circumstantial restlessness, right? There are things that we always have to do, but Stephen Carter's a pastor. He wrote a book called The Thing Beneath the Thing. And I wonder if in our midst of going and producing and our resistance to just being still, what is really going on? What's happening that's going deeper underneath the thing? And this is where I think Mary actually shows us. In fact, you know what's interesting? This story with Mary and Martha. We know Martha's a little crazy, but we also know Mary just finds herself at the seat, right at the feet of Jesus. Do you know the three times you see Mary of Bethany, this Mary? The three times in scripture, Luke chapter 10, she's at the feet of Jesus. John chapter 11, Lazarus has died. The next time we see her, she throws herself 
at the feet of Jesus in her grief. And John chapter 12, Mary is the one who would come and anoint the feet of Jesus. It's interesting. Every time, I've never noticed this before, every time you see Mary, she is at the feet of Jesus. I think rest is finding yourself at the feet of Jesus and it's just meeting Jesus' eye. There is a, um, a Danish sculptor by the name of Bertel Thorwaldsen. What a great name, Bertel Thorwaldsen. I'm just gonna call him Bertel now because if I say Thorwaldsen, that'll add 10 minutes to the sermon. So Bertel, in the 18th century, this, this Danish sculptor wanted to sculpt a statue. He wanted to create a statue of Jesus. So he gets in his mind, he gets this big lump of clay, and he starts working. That's where he starts with. And he begins to work on this, this, this picture of Christ, and he wants to sculpt Jesus in victory. He wants this triumphant, victorious Jesus that he wants to build. So he starts with the clay, and as he gets it to where he thinks it's supposed to be, Jesus' hands are extended, they are raised high, his head is lifted up, and it is a picture of Jesus, and he calls it Christus. And how the story ends on that night, he walked back, he saw the clay sculpture, and he said, that's what I'm going to create. So he closes up his shop, and he leaves, but the windows are open. Storm would come through, Humidity would happen, and he walks into his shop with his apprentice the very next day, and he finds that the clay statue where the arms were up and the head of Jesus was lifted, instead, because of the weather, this happened. Everything dropped. So where Jesus' hands were up, they lowered because of the humidity. It was clay. Where Jesus' head was lifted up and exalted, the next thing you know, it is down here. And he sees that what he envisioned is not what it turned out to be, and it said that he was ready to tip it over, to remold, and to start again. But the apprentice who was with him said, no, 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 wait, don't do that. Because there's, there's something about this image that it shows both victory and it shows rest. If you ever go to a little cathedral in Denmark, you can look at this statue, and what's unique about this statue is the only way you can see the eyes of Jesus is if you kneel at his feet. Hmm. The only way to see the eyes of Jesus is to kneel at his feet. I think that's what Mary knew just a casual gathering, she just wanted to see the eyes of Jesus. In the midst of the death of her brother, in the midst of her grief, she just wanted to see the eyes of Jesus. And in the midst of a heart full of gratitude, in John 12, she just wanted to see the eyes of Jesus. Friends, rest is carving out time to see the eyes of Jesus. And I think the secret, if you really wanna, you wanna get there in your life, this is what I'm finding. The older I get, the sweeter my relationship with the Lord gets. I think the way to get there is this. It's to learn the sacred and beautiful art of abiding. Move over now to John chapter 15. What I find about Jesus in the Gospels is the focus of his ministry was follow me, right? He would see Simon, Andrew, James, and John. They were fishing. They were doing their trade. But Jesus said, follow me, and it changed everything. There's a tax collector by the name of Matthew. He's in his booth just doing his tax collector thing. But Jesus would say, follow me, and it would change everything. So where in the Gospels, in the beginning of his public ministry, follow me, was the focus somewhere towards the Last Supper to when he would ascend, it wasn't follow me, it was abide. That became the new focus. Now, what's interesting about John 15, just a little bit of, um, a little bit of context here. I always think context is so, so important. John 14, Jesus has just finished the Last Supper with his friends. He'd taken the bread, 
body broken. He'd taken the cup, new covenant, forgiveness poured out for many. And they had sung a hymn And Judas, by this point, had already left. He'd washed their feet. Judas was gone. So now Jesus takes the 11 out of the upper room. This is the night that he would be betrayed. And Jesus would take the 11. They would walk out of the upper room. They would walk through the streets of Jerusalem. They would go out one of the old city gates. And they would walk down the Kidron Valley. And they would head towards a place, a garden called Gethsemane. Now, mind you, in this moment, Jesus is literally carrying the weight of the cross. The shadow of the cross is looming, right? So he's headed to Gethsemane. But on his way, this is what I love. In Palestine, if you ever get an opportunity to go, there, there are vines and there are branches and grapes and olive trees. And, and the soil there is just, it's, it's incredible. So as Jesus is leaving, as he's walking towards Gethsemane, he comes across, I believe, some vines, some branches, maybe there's some grapes there, and Jesus stops with the 11, and he teaches them. Can you imagine? Just walking with the Lord, and the Lord would stop, and Jesus would say these words, John 15. I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now, you are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me. The actual word there is abide. But remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain or abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Fruit. Will you say those two words? Much fruit? Much fruit. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, listen, apart from me, disconnected from me, you can do nothing. So again, this move from follow me to abide. And what you see about the life of Jesus in the Gospels is you never saw Jesus hurried or rushed. You found him practicing, just abiding, spending time with his father. Mary was abiding at the feet of Jesus. Martha, Jesus was saying, listen, in the midst of few things that you're worried about right now are justified, but one thing is necessary, and it's to abide. So if you want to learn rest in your life, a couple truths from this one. Number one is we have to stay connected to the vine. If you want to find rest, you have to be connected to the power source. If your refrigerator quits working, I hope that doesn't happen. If it happens, don't blame me. But if it quits working, I'm going to guess if after a period of days, maybe weeks, When that refrigerator comes back on, you are not going to want to make a chopped meal of whatever's left in there and eat it, right? No. Why? Because it it hasn't had any power. There's been nothing there. So after a period of time, the food goes bad because it's not been connected to the power source. My wife, love her to death. It's a good thing, 30 years, right? She loves fresh flowers. She will go to the store. She does this all the time. She loves, she just puts fresh flowers in the house. And that's great, great. I'm still making a hard case for artificial. They look so real. Honey, but I'm cheap. I digress. So she goes and she gets all these flowers. We got them now. And and I love the first day that she puts all these flowers all over the house. It's incredible. Day three, eh. Day five, it just gets kind of sad. Day seven, vacuuming them right like maybe it's time to go get some more do you know I was talking to somebody after the first service and they were telling me they work at a grocery store that sells flowers that he just said recently a lady came back and wanted her money back because the flower died (laughs) well there's something I never would have thought to have tried well of course it died Why did it die? Because it's not connected to the vine. So Jesus is telling his friends, listen, if you want to know peace, it's not going to get easier from this point on. You're going to have to learn to stay connected. I am the vine and you are the branches. And there's this beautiful progression 
that I've never noticed in John 15, one through five. And it, it starts with this. Look, it's highlighted. No fruit, verse two, to fruit on the other side of pruning, to more fruitful, to verse five, much fruit. Isn't that cool? Like Jesus is saying that, listen, it starts off, <laughs> there's nothing there. But what you find when you find the true living source, what happens, it goes from no to fruit to more fruit. The longer you stay connected, there is much fruit in your life. Some of us think that, you know what, just a grape, three grapes, a cluster of grapes, woo, I'm good. Guess what? You were created to bear vineyards for God's glory. Vineyards. And it's, again, not for our glory. This is the goodness of God. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So how we get to a place where we're in the midst of calamity and chaos and crazy and we just look calm is we've learned to make eye contact with Jesus to sit at his feet because we are a people who have learned to abide. Jesus is saying abide. Learn to stay connected to the vine. But the other thing I would say is, is this. And this, this is the hard part, truly. Embrace the pruning. Embrace the pruning. And I think this is why some of us, we just don't wanna stop. And this is why COVID, for so many people, was really challenging. It was a gift for some because they've given themselves to work and going and busy. And when everything stopped, all of a sudden they went, wow, there's more to life than all of this other stuff that I've been doing. But some of us, we stay busy and we avoid rest because we don't want to deal with the damage that we have in our lives. We don't want to really focus on the thing beneath the thing. But what Jesus is saying is there needs to be some pruning. The Father prunes our lives. He takes away the dead branches. Why? So new branches, dead branches, take power away from the overall vine. So there's a pruning so new things can grow. You know that, like, um, Master gardeners uh, in, in these vineyards, what they do, branches, what branches tend to do is they grow down. They go down. So what, what these vineyard people will do is they take these buckets, I didn't know this, and they're filled with water. And they come up and they'll look at these branches, see if branches grow down, what happens is they, get, they run the risk of getting dirty or getting trampled on or rain will come and they'll mildew and they'll turn bad. So what the, the master gardeners, the vineyard owners will do, these buckets of water, is they'll take these branches and they will wash the dirt off of them and then comes the trellis. They'll actually take these branches because they weren't meant to grow down because they run the risk of death. So they start to grow them up and the sun will shine and there's care and there's work that needs to be done. And I just thought, isn't it just like Jesus? I mean, in John 15, three, what did he say? He said to his disciples, you are already clean because of my words to you. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, death, dirt, sin. Jesus is saying, the more you spend time at my feet, the more you find that I wash all of that away, you just have to learn to abide. Brenna's here. The band's gonna come out, and um, I just, I felt the spirit. We're gonna, in just a moment, we're gonna close with this song called Abide, which is, um, I mean, it couldn't get more perfect than the message I'm preaching today. But, um, but I just, I felt like, Brenna, I wanted you to share, I know, but where, where this song came from. Like, how, how did this song come to light? Um, through a season of pruning, hmm. really. Um, Mark just asked me in the 9.30 to share this, so I've been thinking, how do I sum this up? Um, but really, I, I guess in a simple way, I just began to believe some lies over my life. Um, some of them were just due to like factual things, um, some prognosis, some diagnosis, but I began to 
kind of really internalize that and believe that the Lord um, maybe wasn't as good as he says that he is. And I didn't even really realize I was believing that, but it became something that was taking root in my heart yeah. and in my life. And um, mm -hmm. I went to a ministry school, just a week intensive, a worship school, and I went in kind of to rest, honestly. Mm -hmm. I went to go and to spend intentional time with the Lord. And I walked in and, you know, immediately the Holy Spirit was like, I want to speak to you about some things. And I was like, well, no, <laughs> I don't think I can do that. And he said, yeah, I wanna show you some things. And in worship, I would just get on my face because I didn't have to sing. <laughs> And I would get on my face and the Holy Spirit began to show me all of these places in my childhood that I had just picked up lies about him. And a lot of that for me was, um, I was hospitalized a lot as a child. There was a lot of trauma there. And um, I began to ask Jesus where he was in those moments. And he began to show himself over and over and over. And I felt this thing in me that had taken root begin to yeah. be pruned. pruned. And it was like the last night of the, of the conference and we were in worship and I had a vision in worship just in my, just had a picture in my head and I was standing in a vineyard and Jesus was in front of me and he was kind of like you, Mark. <laughs> he was smiling and he was looking at me. I like that. And he was like, do you see the fruit? Yeah. And as far as my eye could see was fruit. And he said, there will be fruit. Mm -hmm. And he was like kind of jumping up and down and looking at me and like, this is the fruit of your life. And I'm just a wreck, you know, I'm crying, I'm just in worship. And a woman gets up to preach and she preaches her message. And at the end of the message, she says, um, she said, I felt like I needed to share this, but you know, I, I struggled with chronic illness my whole life. And when I was 25, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was in a vineyard with Jesus and he began to show me the fruit of my life. And I knew in that moment that the Lord had sent that woman to share that word, to uproot the things in my heart that had taken place that were not of him. And so I am undone. He is just doing such a work over the course of this week. And I come home, I'm home two weeks. I'm just like, thank you Jesus for everything you've done. And I go right back into a season, spend 60 days in the hospital. But had I not experienced the pruning that happened, I would not have been prepared to endure that season. And I knew that the Lord cared more about my heart than anything. And he guided me step by step through each one of those days. And when I got out of the hospital, I could kind of barely walk this little loop by my house and I was walking. And we live in the woodlands, lots of trees. And I just heard that scripture out of John 15. And I went home and I sat at the piano and I wrote, you are the vine and I am the branches. You are the answer to all of my questions. And so this song is a declaration of what I believe, but it's also asking the Lord to teach me what it means to abide. And that's our invitation from him today, to always be learning what it means. And I encourage you to invite the pruning because he prunes so that it can be even more fruitful. My mother has trained me, if I don't trim my crepe myrtles at the end of January, they will not bloom in the spring. <laughs> it's important, and there's an invitation to abide with him today. Thank yeah. you, thank you for sharing that, brother. Yeah. Would, you, uh, would you stand, would you stand? Matthew 11, Eugene Peterson translates this passage this way. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Then come to me. Jesus says, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. Open your hands up, palms up in front of you. Let me pray. Father, thank you for, thank you for this word. God, thank you for the invitation that rest is good. It's good. Abiding at your feet 
taking those moments to see you with us in the garden, to look into your eyes. It's this reminder that you're on the throne, you have everything under control. Father, for the ones that are running from the rest because they don't want to face the hurts. God, I pray that as Paul says, there would be a peace that passes understanding. That Lord, there would be rest that we would find for weary souls in this word today. So Jesus, thank you for walking with us truly. For smiling at us, for reminding us, Father, of your graciousness and your gentleness, even in the pruning, even in the trimming, new life can be found, is being found today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Just as a reminder, this is a conclusion of the service. This is serving as a benediction. But we still have one more song, Abide. Um, I want to, with our prayer team today, I just, I wanna offer prayer over weary souls. You don't have to say a word. If you come and you kneel and you open your hands, palms up, then that just means we're gonna say a prayer of rest specifically over you today. I also need to make this invitation. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never asked Jesus to become Lord of your life, you've never prayed, invited him in, that's really where rest begins. So no, the invitation is here. Come as we sing this last song and may we all find those unforced rhythms of grace, amen. <laughs>